So let's let's perhaps get started. Bonsoir à tout le monde, et à toutes et à tous. Have a um, welcome to everybody. I'm very happy to um, that circles can host a really international group here. Uh, we have uh, speakers from uh, Germany, France, and Switzerland. So even in the discussion, we might also have a multilingual discussion. And I'm very happy to welcome Sigrid Behrendt uh, for Hotel Icouret de l'Université de Neuchâtel et Nicolas Moll et Guillaume Nasso de l'Université de Lorraine. Donc on est très content que vous soyez là et on est très curieux et attend vos, vos, vos Yes, please. So can you see the screen? The yes. PowerPoint is okay? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, first of all, we'd like to, um, to say that we are very pleased to be here and we'd like to thank uh, Sterk for this invitation uh, to present our research about machine translation tools, but also for the connection which was made possible between our different uh, research groups. So thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Um, so before we start, uh, let's have a look at the outline of the presentation. So um, first of all, uh, we intend to give a general overview of uh, machine translation uses by students. Uh, then we will focus more precisely on the students' procedural strategies. And finally, we will conclude uh, with a look at students' perceptions regarding machine translation tools uses, especially in terms of risks and legitimacy for language learning. And uh, we do hope that uh, this presentation, which is based on three different research projects, uh, will give you a precise vision of the way students use machine translation in academia. So, Sigrid? Yeah, thank you. I must say that it feels a bit strange for me to be the one who starts, as I only joined the group of uh, presenters a few days ago. And you should all know that 99% uh, of this presentation was prepared by my colleagues from France and from Switzerland. Um, my name is Sigrid Behrendt. I'm the managing director of the Language Center of Paderborn University. And the survey that I will talk about was initiated and prepared by my former colleague, Robert Wolf, um, who used to work at my language center. And then he uh, moved to Bayreuth because he was offered the position um, as managing director of the language center of Bayreuth University. Um, our two language centers have two, uh, have at least one point in, in common, um, and this is the wide range of um, languages that we offer. So we offer 21 languages at Paderborn University and 23 at Bayreuth University. Um, then the Bayreuth uh, Language Center uh, is much bigger than, than our language center at Paderborn University. Uh, so they offer about 400 classes per year, uh, and we only offer 180 classes per year, and then ha they have um, a, lot, uh, a larger amount of participants, of course. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we started to think and talk about translation tools almost uh, exactly one year ago. Uh, because some teachers had noticed that uh, students uh, handed in text that they uh, that were, they were too perfect for their level. And so uh, we discussed it in our team and um, there were um, also some teachers who said, well, I, I don't think that my students uh, use translation tools and others were sure that this was the case. And so we decided to start with a survey in May 2022 and um, yeah, to find out whether the students uh, were using translation tools and for what purposes and uh, how they felt when, when they were using translation tools. And so our first survey uh, was conducted in May 2022. We had 400 participants um, in the survey. And then some months later, Robert uh, moved to Bayreuth and I asked him, well, uh, 
couldn't you uh, do the same survey at your language center, at your new language center in Bayreuth? And that's what he did. So half a year later, then the first uh, uh, survey, he conducted the survey in, at Bayreuth University and he had 450 participants. And um, now some, some weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, uh, we thought, well, now uh, we know a little bit about the students' use of translation tools, and we also would like to know whether they are using ChatGPT in the context of language learning. So we decided to conduct a new survey, and as the results, uh, as the, 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 the first survey was already one year old, <laughs> we decided to include the, the questions about translation tools uh, once more at Paderborn University. So we have three, uh, we conducted three surveys in total um, about the use of translation tools with a total of 1,144 language learners. Um, in this survey, we had uh, 39 questions, most of them closed uh, multiple choice questions. And um, for categories of questions, we wanted to know some, we wanted to collect some information about the respondents' backgrounds, so courses of study and level um, of in, in the languages. Um, we also asked questions about um, the use of dictionaries. Um, and then the, the main focus was on the use of machine translation tools, MTT, and also attitudes towards uh, translation tools. And now in the new survey that just uh, was conducted uh, yeah, some weeks ago only, we also asked questions about the use of ChatGPT and we didn't ask the questions about dictionaries anymore. And we also wanted to know uh, whether uh, what, what uh, students uh, think about the use of dictionaries and translation tools in exams and how they imagine the future of all this. Uh, there's one thing that you uh, that is interesting in the and for the interpretation of our data, um, as you can see in the, in the last line, um, a large uh, percentage of the students who participated in the survey. Um, participate in the language classes on a voluntary basis. And this is maybe a, um, yeah, a special characteristics. Okay, um, so I'm Sarah uh, Catelli Kuret from the University of Neuchâtel and I actually represent uh, a bigger group of people. So everything that I'm going to say today is based on the work that I've done as part of this project called Digital Literacy in University Contexts. Um, it is a four-year project uh, with four partner universities, and we have three focus tracks. So the one that I'm currently working and I'm going to talk about uh, today is empty literacy, but we've just also added uh, a new strand on chat GPT and automatic text production. Uh, we're at the very beginning of this uh track so there's not much to say there yet um the very first thing we did in 2021 when we started the project uh was to carry out a survey we carried it out first in the four partner universities and we didn't only focus on language students but all students uh and also on university staff uh, teachers, but also academic support staff. So we really wanted to have a very general view of how machine translation was used uh, in different university contexts. It was a very long survey, approximately 250 items. It was a mix of multiple choice questions, a mix of open questions as well. It was a multilingual survey, uh, in German, French, and English for the first survey. Uh, then uh, that makes it obviously a bit more difficult to analyze the open questions. Uh, and we're in the, in the process of doing that now. We carried out a second survey uh, six months later, a slightly modified version. So we tried maybe to 
to change some wording for the questions that we thought were not clearly understood and things like that. And this time we sent it to all Swiss universities and then we got uh, some fresh data. All in all, when we put everything together, we got uh, 4,751 responses and 2,150 students and uh, a bit more staff members and around 79 language teachers. Uh, these were only the people who actually identify themselves as, as language teachers. We might have more, but uh, their data is a bit lost. Okay, then I will let my colleagues. Yep. Um, I will now Carry introduce um, the research group from the Université de Lorraine. Um, we're five researchers who've been working on machine translation tools for two years now. Uh, just like in any language center, uh, this issue of MT is uh, particularly interesting for us uh, because our, our students have to attend language classes. Uh, of course, students use machine translation tools. Teachers know they're using them and students know teachers know they're using them. Uh, but most of the time, students and teachers pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, consequently, from our experience as language teachers, we do know students regularly resort to MT. Uh, but this time, instead of burying our heads in the, in the sand, we decided to tackle the issue with an academic research uh, based on the following questions. Uh, what tools are mainly used by students? Uh, in a practical way, how do students use these tools? And finally, what are students' perception of these tools, especially in terms of uh, legitimacy and opportunities for learning? Okay, and um, in order to answer our different research questions, to, we conducted an anonymous survey based on the use of machine translation tools by students. Uh, the questionnaire consisted uh, in 16 closed and open questions, which were divided into four categories. Uh, Students' profile, of course, concrete use of machine translation tools, representation of the existing tool, and students' attitudes toward these tools. So overall, uh, we got about 500 responses, and after eliminating poorly completed questionnaires, we still had a fairly interesting corpus of more than 400 participants. Um, we used the descriptive statistics to process the responses to closed question. And to process open question, uh, we use a systematic categorization with qualitative analysis. And now we will focus on the first part, that is to say, uh, the use of machine translation by students, starting with Sarah. Okay, so this is not going to be very surprising to you all, but uh, what we found out in all our surveys was that machine translation was a ubiquitous tool. So. 96% of students, and I think it's the same everywhere, uh, say that they have used a machine translation system before. It is not only a ubiquitous tool, if I can have this next slide, but it's also a tool which is used in their daily life, but most prominently at university. Uh, so we ask them how often they used MT and it's not like every day, apparently. So zero was never, 100 was always. And the median is around 37. And uh, it is the highest for academic work or academic studies. So it means that it is a, a tool which is very present in academia. We also asked our students why they used MT or why they did not use MT for those who said no. So they did not use MT mainly because they did not feel confident about the quality of the, of the translations uh, or because they're very cocky and, and think their knowledge of the language is sufficiently good. Maybe it is, maybe I'm being a bit naughty. Uh, and a few because they were not familiar with them. The reason why uh, students use MT is for reasons of efficiency mainly, because it's fast, because it's free, and because it's easy. Uh, and it's really the availability of these tools uh, that seems to have really brought uh, this very ubiquitous uh, use. 
We also see that they use it for documents that are mainly academic, doc uh, academic documents and uh, also documents that uh, people read. That's what you have in, in orange here. So articles probably in websites. This is a receptive use of MT, uh, using, sorry, MT for a receptive use. Uh, and what you have in blue, I think is more uh, using MT as writing emails, writing assignments, presentations, etc. So as you can see, assessment and exams are at the bottom, but still uh, we have 6% uh, of the students who say that they use MT for that. Also, what was very interesting was to try to see in which language they used M MT systems the most. So it's pretty similar between uh, using towards the first language or using towards the second language. As you can see, it's a bit more uh, towards the first language, but still uh, it's quite similar. What we also see is something that we were not really expecting is the 17% of people who use MT system between two languages which are not the first language. And this is probably uh, the, the importance of English as an academic lingua franca that we can see here. Um, and that explains this L2 to L2 uh, use of machine translation. Uh, then, this is very similar. Uh, as you can see, we see that they use it to understand uh, a text in a non-dominant language a bit more than they use it to write a text in, in the non-dominant language. It's exactly what we had before. But what comes before is what really struck us. And this is something that we all found in all our surveys. It is that students actually use MT most of the time to translate individual words or phrases. And this is not a very good idea. If I can have the next slide. Oh. Yeah, so Siggy, you go, and then you explain maybe to us why it's not a good idea. Okay, so I think that's, oh. uh, that's yes. Well, we'll come back to that later, sorry. I thought we had that here, sorry. Okay, yeah? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, concerning the Université de Lorraine, so we now propose to deal with the analysis of the following question asked to students. So could you explain the way you use machine translation in a practical way? Uh, as you can read, this is an open question to which students could answer freely. Uh, these answers being, uh, were studied in a qualitative way, so we treated each answer individually, and the total corpus of answers being close to 6,000 words and we were able to identify trends on the reasons why learners uh, use machine translation. So um, as it was said uh, in the previous slides, the objective of the question is to find out why learners use machine translation tools and then to understand what for. Um, so we have to remind you that these students uh, are not specialists in language and therefore are not specialists in translation. They are uh, standard language learners studying law, psychology, management, business, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we have identified and classified uh, four uh, possible objectives to resort to machine translation tool. Uh, the first one is to bypass an incapacity. Uh, students do not feel capable of completing, of achieving the task given, and therefore resort to machine translation to replace them. Uh, secondly, we've got pragmatism. Student um, who mentioned this reason do not give any information about their foreign language skills, but seems to use uh, mach the machine either to save time or to make their task easier. The third objective we identify is a personal need for verification. Uh, learners do not trust themselves enough and feel the need to be reassured and here by MT. And finally, for learning purposes, so uh, let's be honest, uh, this is by far the rarest case. A uh, learner indicates in that case that the result given by the machine can be an opportunity for them to enrich their knowledge about the language. Uh, the second element which was identified was the diversity of skills. Uh, since the question did not target directly skills, we collected uh, the information when students mentioned skills. 
So not surprisingly, and that is what said uh, before in a different context with Sarah, uh, writing is highly represented in both comprehension and expression. Oral comprehension is absent, and oral expression is limited to uh, pronunciation work, which is not really translation, but which is made possible by some tools. Uh, answers uh, to the research question also addressed linguistic features. So we noted conjugation, spelling, syntax, pronunciation, as we have just mentioned, and lexicon with uh, dictionary type uses, but also seeking for synonyms. So as you can see, uh, more often than not, the use of translator is clearly not typical. As a matter of fact, students do not try always to, to translate, which proves that there is a great confusion uh, with all these different tools, as Sarah has just said. And finally, uh, we gathered data on input entering the translator. We noticed three cases, a translation of the lexical unit, as it was said by Sarah, the translation of a turn of phrase, or the translation of a full sentence, and finally, uh, the translation of an entire text. And this is to get back to what I was saying before, uh, what we find is that students re really tend to use MT as they use dictionaries. And we saw that uh, in an indirect way in our survey, when we asked uh, students why, what tools they used, uh, what machine translation tools they used. And we gave them a few, a few sets answers to choose from. So there was DeepL, of course, Google Translate, and then lesser known uh, machine translation tools. And we had another uh, button. So quite a lot of students actually clicked th this other. And when we asked them, then we asked them, so what? And they had to write it down. And when we analyzed this, we saw that three quarters of the tools that the students thought were machine translation systems were actually dictionaries. So this means that a lot of students use MT uh, as a dictionary, which is not a good idea. That's what I was going to say before. And I think now we have the slide. Yes, that shows you this. So for example, it's a very easy example. If we look up the word enceinte, if I say that, I actually think pregnant woman. And what I get in DPL is speaker, loudspeaker and closure. Not very useful if I'm an A1 or A2 uh, French speaker, a fr French learner, this doesn't help me at all. So if you can just click for the animation to come, yes, what you need to do to get the correct answer in DPL is go down and look at the dictionary. I'm not saying that DPL's dictionary is good, okay? We don't actually know how DPL's dictionary is made. It's probably made by AI. Uh, but what we wanted to emphasize was that this is the type of thing that students should actually look up in a dictionary or they should just put a whole sentence, okay, or just add context uh, for the machine translation uh, tool to work best. Thanks. Um, students also, and that's something that we found, uh, still get very mixed signals about the use of machine translation at university. So it's not a lot of teachers or university staff who encourage or discourage uh, students to use MT. It seems that teachers don't really talk about it in class. And it's quite interesting to, to look at which type of classes students learn about MT. And as you can see, it's mostly language courses and translation courses, or also scientific reading and writing. Okay, so when they when they write their bachelor or master thesis, then someone tells them it's a good idea or it's a bad idea uh, to use machine translation system. And if we look at how uh, it is encouraged and discouraged in these different types uh, of classes. As you can see for translation and language courses, we have more teachers prohibiting and, and advising against the use of MT than really encouraging students to use it. So this is quite interesting, I think. Uh, but for scientific reading and writing, probably the teachers are not language teachers. And they're much more open uh, for students to use this, to use these tools. 
So we thought that was quite interesting. Okay, and here comes one one more proof for the <laughs> finding that students you tend to use translation tools like online dictionaries um, with a very colorful graph, which is maybe not so easy to understand at the first glance. But if you concentrate on the light blue, the red and the dark blue, um, so the light blue is means that they always use it this way, red almost always, and the dark blue frequently use it like this. You can clearly see, and there's uh, not a big difference between um, the receptive and the productive use of uh, translation tools. When reading and when writing, students tend to use it um, um, mostly to look up single words and expressions. And as Sarah showed, this is not a good idea. So we try to um, integrate this into the language classes and, and show the students that this is not the, a good thing because um, the, these tools need context to be accurate in their translation. Okay, and this is um, an, another finding which is quite quite interesting. Uh, we found out that uh, students um, not so much use it use uh, translation tools for languages that they that they already master well. So in the first survey, it was only five percent of the students who said that they use it more often for languages that they already master well. And 60% who said, well, I, I use it for languages that I still have insufficient command of, which made us think about the question, uh, what level do you need to be able to evaluate the output of translation tools? And now there's an interesting trend if you compare the, the findings from the first survey, the second and the third survey, and there's always six months between the surveys. So uh, the number of students who use it for languages that they already master well increases yeah from five to eleven percent uh, i have no uh, explanation for this finding but i find it quite interesting and if you look at the results for the use of chat gbt uh, this seems to be uh, quite different so 22 percent uh, of the students say that they use it for languages that they already master well I don't know if there's the feeling that they, uh, yeah, that they trust the ChatGPT less than than the translation tools. I don't know. It's but I find it quite interesting to see this difference between ChatGPT and tra and translation tools. All right. So we'll now discuss uh, procedural strategies used by students. Um, and I'd like to warn you that this slide we call the endless slide. <laughs> so in our analysis of the responses to this question that Nicola was talking about earlier, could you explain the way you use machine translation in a practical way? We wanted to uh, identify sets of behaviors that students might adopt towards MTT. We therefore collected different ways of doing things that we placed on a continuum ranging from a total dependence uh, on the tool to independence from it. This is the arrow you're seeing right now. Uh, let's start with what we call constrained conservation. This is a bad translation, sorry. Um, here, learners keep the result uh, from the translator without any modification, which implies in the most optimistic hypothesis, a great confidence in the tool or a very weak linguistic autonomy forcing learners to use MTT. Then we find learners who verify or try to verify the obtained result. We have identified two types of verification. Uh, first, verifications uh, that consist of putting the same inputs into another translator to get an alternative translation and compare results. Or what we call back and forth practices, uh, which consist in putting the result of the translator back into the translator and to go back to the original language to see what it looks like. At the second level of verification, uh, learners no longer depend on MT to do both the translation work and its verification. Learners use personal knowledge, a resource person, or other resources uh, such as dictionaries or con concordances. Naturally, the second, uh, second level of verification re requires more elements, uh, such as linguistic and metalinguistic knowledge, a scholarly network, or the mastery of other linguistic thoughts. 
For these people, at the end of the verification, two situations are possible. Uh, either they will validate the result uh, given by the translator, and we now speak of informed conservation and can be more or less informed, uh, or they decide to modify the text. In that case, we have observed a series of reasons that motiv motivate uh, these modifications. Uh, first, students may seek to appropriate the text that has come out of the translator. In this case, uh, students realize they could, have, could not have produce, uh, this, produced this text because of its quality or uh, its style and seek to make it seem like they produced it, sometimes worsening the quality of the text. Um, then we find a desire to contextualize the production. Uh, the student is specialized in a field like uh, psychology, for example, and the text produced by the translator is not LSP enough. So they will uh, modify uh, the text to adapt it to its context of use. Uh, of course, we have correction of the results uh, where students correct the translator's language errors, or maybe I should say perceived errors. Uh, and finally, some students try to improve the text. Uh, so the output is correct, but not satisfied with it and make modifications that they feel relevant. At the top of our continuum, we find what we have called selective use. Um, students produce their own text and will carry out a, tr a translation to compare it with their own production and possibly keep some interesting, interesting elements that they select them themselves. These practices show a real independence uh, from the tool, but their objective remains the completion of a language task. The last step of our continuum is the use for learning purposes. Here, the general objective is no longer the completion of a translation task, uh, but the latter becomes the means to a general objective of language learning. Uh, the translator is used out of curiosity to see how things can be said, phrased and rephrased, and the translator offers ways of saying and doing things in the target language. There is no focus on a particular task anymore, nor any dependence on the tool. Still studying responses to this question, we saw various personal attributes that helped uh, to explain each uh, student's placement on this continuum. For example, language uh, proficiency. It's easy to imagine that students with great difficulties in a foreign language will uh, quickly resort to a tool that seems to be able to do the work for them. On the contrary, uh, a student who's very advanced in the language will find it easier to choose not to use a translator. Then we have confidence in the tool. Uh, a high level of confidence in the tool means that its results are considered reliable and that it's therefore logical to use it. On the other hand, a lack of confidence will lead to avoiding the tool or checking its output. Then we have the sense of self-efficacy. So the term uh, introduced by Bandura uh, in the 80s designates uh, an individual's belief about their ability to achieve particular performances. Uh, with a strong self of self-efficacy, Students feel capable of modifying what the translator proposes, but will eventually write the text themselves and use the translator as one of many resources at their disposal. On the contrary, in the presence of a low sense of self-efficacy, students will quickly consider uh, the tool, a tool is needed to complete the task. Uh, then we have meta-language competence and meta-linguistic competence. We consider these skills uh, to be critical in the analysis that is necessarily made of the, of the MT output and that will lead or not to the choice of making modifications. Uh, in the presence of a low, of, of weak metalanguage uh, meta and metalinguistic skills, uh, the analysis uh, cannot be carried out and the learner is not able to check and modify their text. Finally, we have agency. Uh, as a reminder, agency is the ability to think freely and make choices. Uh, in our context, we notice that from a certain point on, Students make really make the choice to become the author of their text rather than working on the basis of the translator. Um, we wanted to, to talk about agency because the elements we have thanks to this survey do not allow us to say that the abilities listed here automatically trigger a will to become the author of one's text. Uh, and in other words, I can have all necessary abilities and never stop using the translator. And on the contrary, I can be a bit limited in my ability uh, but make the choice to construct my text myself. You have survived. Congratulations. Okay, uh, so we actually found very similar things in our survey, except that we don't have the very nice schematic that Guillaume showed us. 
Uh, but it's very similar. So what we found was that most of the time uh, students were satisfied uh, with the translation that was produced by the machine translation system. So as you can see, uh, the, the, oh gosh, what do you call that? Abscess on the right uh, is uh, the confidence in the tool. And the one at the bottom is the number of people who actually uh, said that. So you actually have, uh, it's the, the upper part uh, of the graph that is very uh, blue, meaning that it's about 70 uh, people, sorry, people, the median is at 70, zero is never, 100 is always, so it means that they're quite a lot of the time happy with the machine translation system. And if you can change it, uh, we also had an open question because there was an other question that you, if you can see on the graph on the on the right, we asked them how they checked that the machine translation was accurate. And uh, we gave them some options. So they compare it to the original text. Uh, this is a question also of being able to, 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 to see a potential mistake. They use back translation, as Guillaume also mentioned. They use a second MT system. They ask a native speaker. So this is very similar to what uh, Guillaume showed. And uh, quite a lot of people wrote other. And in these others, it was basically things like checking the outputs, was basically trusting their own judgment, trusting their guts, if you want. Or things that we had said before, but which were emphasized here. So compare with other tools, ask someone else, etc. And we also had something which was quite interesting. I think that translating only single words uh, made the result more trustworthy, which is the absolutely opposite. Okay, we actually need to have sentences uh, in order to do that. And we, we actually saw that in Sigrid's um, graph that she showed before, this idea of word sentence and full text. Okay, uh, the more you went and full text was like, ooh, not really good. So that, I think that's quite interesting. We really have the same results. Uh, also, another thing that was quite interesting in our study is that we noticed that people actually always focus their agency on post edition. Uh, so they never touched, very rarely uh, touch the text in their first language, in their first language that they put in the system so that would be pre-edition uh 70 percent of people never do that whereas 77 of the people actually change the empty raw output that they get and this is a bit problematic uh as Sigrid also was saying that if they're not very good in in the language in the second language then how can they change that. It's easier for them to change the L1 rather than change the L2. Also, several studies have shown that users uh, find it really difficult to post edit row empty output. It's a cognitive question probably uh, linked to this idea of, of uh, false fluency, that the text just sounds so great that we just forget that it doesn't actually say what we want it to say. Uh, so this has been shown several times, and uh, Locke and Leshoget in 2021 have shown that uh, even for first language uh, speakers, it's really difficult to find mistakes in empty output. Okay, I think I should have put this slide earlier in the, in the presentation because it comes back to the question uh, why uh, students uh, choose to use uh, empty tools. And here I, I um, the, the, these, uh, gra this graph is based on the uh, responses of all the participants of all the three um, surveys. And you can see in this uh, graph that they see the potential uh, of using um, or that they see an, a potential in the use of um, uh, translation tools and uh, because they it allows them to check their sentences or texts 
to learn new words and to remember words that they already knew, uh, but that they have forgotten and, or that they um, don't have in their active use. Um, and there is this the, the sentence which it was a multiple choice question and the sentence um, which has been chosen the, um, um, by the majority of the students was that the, the to control check their sentences so there's this need uh, to to check what they produce themselves and we could see that in the survey about chat gpt as well that they use it this way mm -hmm. oops so now we're moving to the third part about how uh students see empty systems um so we wanted to know if students knew what mc systems were so as you could see not very well and also how it worked and we asked them the question how confident are you uh, that you understand how empty systems work and as you can see students were quite confident okay 58 percent said yeah i'm confident i understand i'm not not confident at all. I'm not extremely confident, but I'm confident that I understand how it works. And as you could see, you can put the animation now. Uh, as you could, if you remember, we, we noticed that students didn't even know the difference between a machine translation system and a dictionary, which is not really their fault, okay? Because a lot of machine translation systems actually sell themselves as dictionaries. Uh, so it's not it's understandable this mistake, but it's not true that they understand how MD system works because they would never put a single word in a machine translation system if they did. Also, we wanted to know if they were aware of the risks uh, of using machine translation system. And we asked them several questions for that. And they're very aware of the risks of miscommunication this is really important or misunderstanding, but everything that has to do with more uh, ethical or legal or things like that is not very, uh, I mean, they're not very aware of that. A bit, but not many of them. Uh, intellectual property seems to be something also important. So they're, the safety of their data uh, and Academic integrity is higher up, but still not very much. Uh, and it was very interesting. It doesn't show here, but we also tried to single out some students who had received uh, a quite an intensive um, machine translation uh, present, uh, presentation about machine translation. So there were translation students and uh, their awareness of the risks were much higher uh, than just the normal student so that was quite interesting so if you if you tell them about it then they remember uh, also we asked them what the concerns were and again we see is about miscommunication and misunderstanding so about altered content or altered style the security is lower and then that was very nice to see that only 3.6% of the students said they had no concern at all. So that was good. Okay, um, concerning the Université de Laurent, we focused on the following question. According to you, is MT a legitimate tool uh, to learn the language? Why or why not? So um, on this slide, uh, we present the result of an analysis based on automatic language processing tools. So in other terms, uh, we simply search for the responses in which the words yes and no appeared. Uh, as you can see on the slide, out of all responses, 221 students consider that MT can be a learning tool, while uh, 56 do not. Uh, even if these answers are actually more complex than a simple yes or a simple no, uh, this first approach allows us to have an overall idea of the students' answers. A vast, large majority sorry, answered yes, 50% uh, said no, and about a quarter gives a more complex answer. And so um, we'll now go into the complexity of these answers by detailing why some students think it could be a good idea and what they think it is not. 
And let's start with students answering no. Um, so first of all, a very large number of students say they prefer other ways of learning uh, foreign languages, foreign language, sorry, and therefore prefer, for example, um, language classes, exchanges, travel, uh, the use of other tools such as video, games, reading, etc. Uh, as some students indicated, it will never replace a course. You have to travel uh, to learn a language. Um, in addition, they insist that the work done with a translator results in poor uh, retention. There is therefore no added value of MT for learners. And thus we got answers such as our memory doesn't have time to work or we don't learn vocabulary. Uh, there is, they also point out that the reliability of tools is sometimes insufficient with frequent mistakes. So we can then um, have answers such as it is often not correct or translation uh, may be wrong. Uh, some people, some students reproach MTT for not being legitimate in the context of university. Uh, this illegitimacy, illegitimacy sorry, is reflected in responses such as it would be too easy, uh, I find it too easy, or my favorite one, which is facility should be banned. And uh, finally, uh, some students denied uh, the status of learning tool to MT simply because it was not designed, uh, designed for learning. As the following example indicates, these tools were designed for translation and not for learning. Um, so let's move on to students who answered, yes, MT can be an opportunity for learning. Yeah, so learners seem to consider MT as possible learning tools for four main re reasons. Uh, first, a large number of students value the vocabulary input uh, from MT. In this example, uh, the student says that MT helps them to uh, develop their vocabulary. Uh, secondly, some students appreciate the reading function of the automatic translator. Uh, in this example, we can, we can read yes for the listening option to help me uh, with pronunciation. Uh, a third reason is psychological. Some students uh, say that the translator is a support that makes them feel uh, more confident. Uh, you can read an example from a student who wrote, uh, it allows you to break the deadlock when you're stuck. And finally, students put forward active manipulation of the target, la target language. Uh, the translator is an additional contact with the language, uh, an additional opportunity to observe it and to reflect on it. Uh, so the student in the example here um, emphasizes that being active in the foreign language is what, is what allows them to retain things. This is what motivates students to consider MTT as a possible uh, learning tool. Okay, last but one slide, I think. Um, we asked this question about attitudes in a slightly different way. Uh, we asked students how they felt when, when they were using uh, machine translation tools. And here again, we, we worked with um, multiple choice options. And in this graph, I colored the positive feelings in green and the negative feelings in red. And you can see that the good feelings, the positive feelings prevail. So they feel good because they learn new words or they feel more confident because they think it helps them to improve their grammar or style. But uh, uh, about a fifth or a quarter of the students also chose the option that they feel a little guilty because uh, they think they shouldn't use them or um, unsure because uh, they weren't sure about their ability to, to, to judge the quality of the output or um, yeah, that they feel bad because I, they feel I'm making it too easy for myself. So, but the good feelings prevail in, in our students. Next slide. Yeah, this was uh, one of the, the questions that we asked at the end of the, our surveys. We wanted to know whether they, uh, the students wanted us, so the teachers, to address the topic of translation tools in the language classes. And on the left, you have the results from last year, from the Paderborn and the Bayreuth survey. So there we had 63%, uh, so two thirds of the students who said, yes, please talk about it in, in the classrooms and 34% who said no. And um, in the new survey uh, from some weeks ago, 
we changed the question a little bit uh, because we know that uh, many teachers have started to address the topic in the classrooms. So we are also uh, uh, offered the option, yes, and it was already addressed in the classroom um, next to, to the simple yes. And so if you calculate the yes and the other yes, uh, it makes 85% of the students who want us to address the topic in the language classes. So talk about the functions of translation tools and about, um, yeah, maybe the, the benefits and also the dangers of using translation tools. Okay, to conclude very briefly, uh, I think you will have noticed that the same problems occur in all national contexts. Uh, our results were really not significantly different. Uh, it seemed that prior to maybe 2023, uh, machine translation was still very taboo in language classes. And that's why I put the question mark, because I have the feeling that things are changing quite quickly. And uh, what we found in, in, in my survey uh, and in our survey is changing, as Siggy just showed. Um, also, what stays uh, is the need for training. I think both for uh, students and for teachers, uh, we need to, to look at not only machine translation literacy, but digital tool literacy more generally, and, and bring in chat GPT with there, bring in the dictionaries in there again, bring in the corpora also. So I think this is something which is important. Uh, and the last point has to do uh, with the way students uh, have to change their learning routines. They're used to, to using machine translation as a dictionary and probably just telling them that it's not a good idea is not going to be enough. We really have to try to find what tasks uh, and what discourse will make them change. And we think that we still need further research uh, on this. And we are looking forward to carrying on uh, with this topic. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. And I think we still have a few minutes for questions. If anyone wants yeah. to ask something. Yes, thanks a lot to all of you. It was really very interesting to listen to your results and to, to see uh, yes, some um, different points which reappeared. Uh, and I also enjoyed that I could really feel that you were all still uh, passionate about the topic. You have a, a certain, <laughs> a lot of commitment. Uh, and I think you, you are very, um, it is very correct to address us and to challenge all of us, the whole community of, of, of language, people researching in language education and, and also uh, working in language education. So please, uh, colleagues, if you have some questions you would like or points you would like to bring up. Um, yes, we have some five minutes left. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you can either just talk or write uh, in the chat if you if you don't want to say that. Then we take languages and uh, sorry, we take questions in all sorts of languages. So Sigi can answer in German, mm -hmm. and the rest of us can answer in French. <laughs> Some of us might be a little bit overwhelmed by all the results. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Anne. Anne. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. What is what is really interesting actually is the fact that in the three countries, in the three contexts, you obtain roughly the same results. And uh, that is very comforting because um for example, at the University of Lorraine, uh, we have started last year, or was it the year before, introducing um, in our course for first-year first students of all 
disciplines, that is to say, uh, human sciences, psychology, history students, and so on, who learn uh, English generally, but even for other languages. And thanks to Guillaume, who helped us do that, we have started in introducing um, a session where we try and explain the students that a dictionary is not the same thing as a corpus and that deep L is not a dictionary. And we try to make them try different tools. For example, that we try to make them compare uh, Google Translate and deep L and word reference and that kind of thing. And uh, they seem to find this interesting. We hope that when they attain uh, the bachelor's degree level or even the master's degree level, they will have um, understood that uh, these are different tools and that you can use each of them, but for different reasons. I think that's interesting for students. Of course, we need to talk about that as language teachers. Thank you, Anne. Again, <laughs> yeah, you uh, confirm yes the importance, uh, the importance, and uh, of of bringing up the topic, and that's of course a part of our professional integrity. Also, yes, like fostering uh, digital literacy within the classroom, and not leaving it to all other teachers or lecturers who might not even be. Uh, so eager to bring it up or not not aware enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, may I just ask you, so sorry, you brought up that there is, of course, a need for further research. I guess that there will be a lot of, of calls uh, concerning the use of chat GPT, but, uh, and, and you also mentioned before uh, in another context that your own research group is going to to probably get uh, get mm -hmm. the funds to start uh, another research on ChatGPT, is is there also are there also other projects colleagues would know of, uh, which would deal uh, with the use of ChatGPT, for example, in language education. Yeah. Well, as I said, I did this mm -hmm. small survey, but mm -hmm. yeah, and I presented um, the first results uh, last Friday in Bochum. There was a, a little conference uh, mm -hmm. about um, uh, the use of, of uh, artificial intelligence in, in the context of academic writing and language learning. And I, uh, yeah, I noticed that there are other projects, uh, are other similar projects, and I also said that I, uh, will, I'm very willing to share the questions uh, we asked and, and the questionnaire and uh, several people, uh, several colleagues already sent me an email that they would like to have the questions and do the same survey at their institutions. So I, I hope that we can keep in touch and then share the, the, the results and, and uh, compare and yeah have a bigger corpus than Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I add a comment? Yes. Sabina. Sorry? Can Carmen? I add a comment? This is Carmen. Okay. <laughs> no, yes, I just want I just wanted to say that uh, maybe uh, some of you may not know that, uh, but in the latest issues of a language learning in higher education, there is an article by Sarah and Nicholas uh, that appears. It's a very interesting article. It's on this uh, um, on this topic. So I just uh, wanted to let everyone know about it, so, uh, and I want to encourage you to read the article. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the publicity. <laughs> yeah, and I would also like to encourage you to write, yes, to publish then later on your results in a new issue of our language journal. So, okay, so this is perhaps a, a very nice note. So we have still lots of things to do, be it in research, in teaching, in uh, teacher training, there we could also um, pick up some of your initiatives within our circles community. So we are certainly going to work in that um, area too. And thanks again to all of you. Merci beaucoup. C'était un grand plaisir. And I wish you 
a lot of courage for further research and uh, before that a very nice evening and wonderful weekend <laughs>